snow's going to be flying. <laughs> I'll do what it says to do. <laughs> I'll say what it says to say. This is the pure, living power of God. My heart is open and receptive to your word this morning, Lord. Amen. You guys put up with so much from me. You really do. I was going to say, you must really love me because the Presbyterian church down the road, they're not preaching snow. So <laughs> we got to put up your, your snow. Amen. Hey, a couple things to keep you in the loop with. Um, if I know I, a bunch of them are out, but if you are a home group leader, right, or a, a Bible study leader, can you please stand up with me really quick? Stand up today. I'd like to see you guys out there today. Well, kind of in the fall, P Pastor Linda, right? So there's only a couple in the house today. Chris is out there standing up, by the way. He's waving. So awesome. And uh, I just want to let you guys know that a part of those Connect cards is, and you guys can sit down, thanks, as joining a home group um, or a small group, Pastor Linda's is here. Um, they're taking a break for the summer with Bible studies. Pastor Roger has what they call Deep Sea, which is young adults, um, home group that meets weekly. And uh, thank you, Chris. And uh, Chris has a home group on Wednesdays. Out front, um, if you'd like a list of all our home groups, we've got nine home groups that are meeting. That's a lot, you know. And so what we're finding is, is um, going to church here is important. But going to a home group is really awesome too, right? And uh, we have them in Chittenango, uh, a couple, one in Oneida Castle, all over Oneida. Uh, weekly getting together and just having fun with community with one another. Actually being able to talk about the Bible and learn, you know, when you're in a small group, you can ask questions. Also, um, uh, you know, if there's things going on in your life, you can really talk about those things, you know. And, and so I just want to encourage you to maybe join a home group somewhere, you know. And um, they're um, really excited about what they're doing. Hey, coming up on September 11th is our picnic. So that's a great time to bring a friend, too. We're going to be at uh, Verona Beach. And um, so we have, we have a pavilion out there. We'll give you more directions on that day of how to get to the pavilion. Um, there's a sign-up that's going to be going around some point today. Um, look at that sign-up. See kind of what um, is a lot of there. You know, if we've got like 50 people signed up for spaghetti, I think that would be awesome. Ditch the hamburgers and hot dogs, but not everybody has that Italian side of me like Michelle, right? <coughs> you guys have meatballs like this big. That's not a meatball. What is that? A meatball's like, damn. Yeah. It's a burger and a ball. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so coming up on September 11th, that'll be a great time. Come to church. I mean, we all dress what we want anyway, but we used to, back in the day, used to everybody wear shorts and things like that. You could do that anyway, but, you know, come on out. It'll be fun. Bring a friend. Uh, coming up on September 22nd, we're starting up our discipleship school, which is cool. Our goal is to offer one core class. So what does that mean? Um, a core is like the foundations of what we believe. Amen. And I don't care if you've taken it once or twice, it's always good to go back and grab a core class. Amen? One of the reasons I threw my back out the way I did was because my core got weak. I stopped swimming, and so it caused problems later on. You know, you want to make sure that your core is strong. How many guys are athletic types out there? Any six-packs out there besides Ryan? No, just kidding. <laughs> He's like, I can't believe he said that. You know, having a strong core is really important. Have a strong foundation is really, really important. We're going to be offering at least discipleship one for core. A book of the Bible is great, too. We'll be offering a book of the Bible. And then what we call Christian living. So it's like a topic or something. Um, at least those three. We'll probably have more. And that will be on Thursdays. So what we'll do is we're going to take our midweek church service. And people will come just like this at 730 for regular worship for 15 minutes. And then we're going to break out into different areas of the building with at least three different classes and come back together at the end for prayer. We're going to do that September uh, 22nd all the way till the Thursday before Thanksgiving. So I'm excited about that. So sign up for a discipleship class. All right, we are going to keep on going with Colossians. You guys ready? Grab your Bible. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. <clears throat> Colossians 2, 6 through 7. It says, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. All right, so I want to dig into that scripture uh, today. Remember kind of the background of what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the early church um, and with a lot of early church problems in the Philippians and Philippi, um, Ephesus, just to name a few. A lot of these new churches are springing up, right? 
there's this massive move of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, right? And, and you see tons of people get saved. And so now the Christian uh, way of, of living in Christ is just exploding. And so there's lots of little groups meeting here and there. But there's also big groups getting together in the thousands, right? In the thousands. And some of the things that were coming against the big group was the fact that you really don't need Christ in the church. There are other ways to get to God. This is the types of things that were infiltrating the church. Uh, Judaism, which would be uh, reli uh, being religious, said, hey, the old way that we did things back in the Old Testament, the old way that we did things before Christ is the way that we should still be doing church. And Paul's like, that's not true. That's the old wineskin. We've got a new wineskin coming, right? Then they had this Gnostic thought of knowledge where you could have a knowledge that went above Christ. You could have a knowledge that took you closer to God and, or even farther, make you a God. And Paul's like, that's crazy. And then they had these charismatic individuals that were infiltrating the church saying that they had some sort of special revelation that bypassed Christ, that if you followed them, you could get closer to God that way too. And basically Paul is saying this is all a bunch of hogwash, you know. He's, and he's saying as you got saved, you should continue to walk in him. Now remember that word walk for the Jews was like, you know, if you go for a walk, you're going to go on a journey, right? And you're going to progress on that journey. And when you're on that journey, you're going to experience some things. You're probably going to experience some really good things. You might experience some, some bad things or not so good things. But as you walk and as you journey with Christ, so you get saved and you give your life to Christ, as you gave your life to Christ, it's the same way that you should walk or journey with Him. Amen? And these false religions and ways of thinking, we're trying to draw people away from Christ. And Paul's like, that just can't happen. Because Jesus is the Son of God. Because Jesus is God. And without Christ, you don't have anything. Amen? And so that's what he's kind of looking at. Amen? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says this. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And while I'm thinking about this, Nigel, I want you to think of the top three Christmas gifts that you want for coming up for Christmas this year. And Pastor Linda, you can take notes if you want. Just kidding. Okay, top three gifts. All right, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift. Somebody say the gift. All right, it's the gift of God, not by works. Another translation says, not by yourselves, that anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Okay, Nigel, top three gifts. I know, I know, I know. In fact, give me one, and then Bob give me one, and Dan give me one. Look what you did. The whole, now the whole thing is getting, what do you think? Uh, Syracuse basketball jersey. Good. How about you, Bob? <laughs> Can't think of any. I could come up with ten right now. No, I'm just kidding. How about you, Dan? Okay. Bible study tool, something. Okay. Okay, Amy knows. Hold on. <laughs> I'm write this down. <laughs> <I'm just> <laughs> Amy wants a new circular saw. Because <laughs> I burned hers out. Okay, it's true. So what if on Christmas, everybody's gathered around the tree. Let's just say that Dan is there, and Nigel's there, and Amy's there. And Nigel gets the jersey he wants. And this is what he says. Yes!
Sometimes Christians, it's all right. sometimes Christians are God brown nosers. They try to earn God's love and respect. You can't earn it. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, you know, we, we get to that point where I gave my life to Christ, so I earned and deserved this. No, that's not true. You didn't deserve what you got. But as you continue to walk, we don't deserve what we get either. But what Jesus did qualifies us, not what we do. Amen? So it doesn't matter how many Christian bumper stickers you got. I mean, let's go back to the 80s just for kicks. You guys remember WWJD? What would Jesus do? Everybody had the what would Jesus do sticker on it, you know? Was that the 90s? Okay, 90s. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Riley, can you stand up? There it is. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Amen? There's nothing wrong with that, right? But that's not what got us saved. Amen? What got us saved is what Jesus did on the cross for us. So what Paul does is he lays out four different really cool Greek words to describe how we're supposed to connect with Christ. We're going to talk about that really quickly today. We're going to apply it. And then we're going to show you what happens as a result of it. Somebody say, I'm ready. Okay. First word he uses is rooted. He says rooted and grounded in him. I'll never forget when I was younger, early 20s. <clears throat> Excuse me. I went to this one dentist. He's great. Finally, I got in there and they pulled the tooth. The reason the, the tooth was so hard to pull is because in the back, these teeth have some really deep roots that are grounded in your mouth, right? And be absolutely immovable, right? Like those stubborn teeth, kind of, right? We started out rooted and grounded in Christ. Paul says you need to continue rooted and grounded in Christ. Amen? Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Psalms 1, 1 through 3 says this. The way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly, blessed is man. Or I'm sorry, that's the top, the, the whatever. This is the scripture. He who wa um, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the sea of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates in it day and night. Planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season, whose life also is, will not wither, and whatever he says shall prosper. Notice those words, planted by the rivers. Amen? We need to be rooted and planted in Christ. Paul is saying, you know what? If you don't have Christ in this church, if you don't have Christ in your life, you don't have anything. He says, don't let anybody convince you that Jesus is not the Son of God. Don't let anybody convince you that Jesus is not the way to heaven. When you got saved, you didn't believe that, and you shouldn't believe it now. Stay rooted and grounded in Christ. Somebody say, yeah. Amen. Amen. So rooted and grounded in Christ. When I was young one time, I did something. I don't remember what it was. But my mom says, you're grounded to your room. 
I remember, you're rooted, at gr you're grounded to your room. After an hour, I was like, oh, I'm getting hungry. I'd eaten an hour before. I go downstairs, Mom, can I get something to eat? No, you're grounded to your room. A <laughs> couple hours go by, I'm like, Mom, there's some friends, because I had a window that overlooked the park. I got some friends over at Seneca Street Park. Can I please just go over with them? I'm sorry. No, you're grounded to your room. You know what I'm saying? If you're grounded to something, you're stuck there. Now, I'm not saying you're stuck with Christ. I'm telling you that when you ground yourself and you stay rooted in Christ, good things happen. Somebody say, yeah. yeah. Amen. So he uses that word, um, grounded. I'm grounded in Christ. No matter what is happening, I'm going to stick to him. I'm grounded. I'm grounded to Christ. He's my foundation. Second word he uses, or third word he uses, built up in him. Built up in him. I'll go back to the scripture and read it again so you can see it. Built up in him. <clears throat> As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted, built up in him. Amen. Um, let's see here. John 17, 20 through 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will, will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Amen? Um, Jesus, we're supposed to have Jesus in our hearts to build us up in him. When you got saved, right, you received Christ. It was the beginning of this building, this foundation. How many have ever felt kind of discouraged and you spend some time in the Word, and you start to feel a little more built up. Amen? How many of you have uh, felt a little discouraged, and you spend some time in prayer, and all of a sudden you're starting to feel a little more built up? Because that's what Christ does in your life. He builds you up in Him. The devil wants to tear you down and destroy you. God wants to build you up and turn you into what He created you to be in this earth. Built up in Him. Isn't that good? Isn't that good that, that God wants to... And then not only that, I, don't have time, I won't get the scriptures, another scripture, I don't have time to get to it, but it says that as you are being built up in Him as individuals, as a church, we're being built up together. Isn't that good? And that was the reason Paul was so concerned about these early churches, because a, a, a small church full of a lot of people that love God with all their hearts could do great things. A big church can do that too. But we can do more together than we could ever do apart. And so not only is God building us up, but he's building us up together in him. Has somebody ever shared something in a small group or a home group or maybe even in church and you think, boy, I can really understand. I can identify with that. I can see that God is building them up in, in that area. And if, build, if God can build Adam up, if God can build Doug up in this area, God can build me up in this area. See, we're being built together. Isn't that good? We're growing together. I started pastoring here as a youth pastor. I was 20-something, three. You guys watched, hopefully you saw me grow up a little bit, you know. You guys saw me kind of grow up in my faith. Some of you guys, we've been together a long time. Bill, Christine, John, Connie, Mark, and Denise, just to name a few. Michelle, Linda, the Delbert. We've been doing this together for a while We've been growing through some things. You guys have seen me grow some, through some things. We've seen each other grow through some things. We're being built up as individuals, but we're being built up together. Amen? Isn't that good? So he says you need Christ so that you can be built up. Amen? It's only God that can build us up. So what's the result of these words? Jesus changes us. As a result of being connected to him, Jesus changes us. Without Jesus, there's no real change. Without God, there's no real change. Just like um, Jesus saved us, as we walk over time, he changes us. And growth takes time. I don't care who you are. If you were born just a couple months ago, you're not going to be six foot five in a week. <laughs> the receding hairline I have did not just happen. It took time. <laughs> Growth takes time. You got saved right away. But there are things in your life 
that God is trying to root out of you, things in your life that over time, Christ is, God is going to put in you, and over time, you're going to be different. Diane, I bet you're a little bit different than you were when you were saved. Look up, I mean, I think back what I looked like before I was, when I was early saved, or even, you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? Over time, right? They grow. Joyce Myers, I love that. I've shared this example before, but I just love it because it's so true. She was talking about how she and Dave together had this, um, this smoking habit that was really driving them crazy. And one um, church service, they gave this huge altar call for people who wanted to let go of cigarettes. And she said, Dave goes to the altar, her husband, and he gets delivered from cigarettes like that. All of a sudden, he, st- he puts a cigarette in his mouth. He can't even handle it. He can't just smoke anymore. She said it didn't happen like that for her. She said, you know, just a little while longer, you know, she still had the craving. She said she was walking back to her car one time, and on the curb there was a cigarette butt. She said she grabbed that cigarette butt, got in the car, rolled the window down just a little bit more, and smoked as much as she could to get You know what I'm saying? But over time... I don't think Joyce Bonner smokes anymore, but, you know, over time, she says that that got pulled out of her life. See, there are things that happen when we get saved, but that's the beginning. That's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of a journey with Christ, and that's what Paul is saying. He says the, the, the result of being grounded in him, the result of being rooted in him, the result of being built up in him, right, the result of that is change over time. Amen? We cannot change ourselves. Here's an evangelist that came through about 15 years ago. And um, he claimed to have a, a, a big missionary ministry. And um, he was having revival services. And uh, he came to me and he says, yeah, me and some friends. He goes, we, we went out over here to this park and we, we got him saved. And my spirit just went, Ugh, that's not good. Because he didn't get anybody saved. He can't even save himself. I can't save myself. How can I save somebody else? I can't change on my own. How can I change somebody? That's God's whatever. Amen? And so (coughs) that's something that God does. What's the point? The point is Jesus. He's the author of our salvation. That means he started the good work and he'll finish the good work. Amen? As we're connected to God, that's why it says in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. There's this vine that's filled with life. And there's these branches that are connected to it. And these branches that are connected to it start bearing fruit. They start bearing fruit not because of what they're doing on their own. Branches are bearing fruit because of their connection to the root. Hey, that rhymed. Maybe I should start a new career in rapping. <laughs> Sorry. You know, they get fruit because of, you know, they're connected to that vine. Amen? So are you connected to the vine? And and I guarantee there are going to be distractions in your life. I guarantee there's going to be seasons in your life. I guarantee there's going to be times in your life when you're struggling to connect to the vine. And one of the reasons I think people struggle connecting to the vine is be, they, because they think too much about what they do. There's too much of an emphasis on what they do and not enough of an emphasis on Christ and what he did. Amen? There's been times in my life, I mean, I think sometimes God has spoken to me to be the lo- loudest when I've been the most broken. There's been times in my life that God has spoken to me when I just haven't been connecting the way I should. But that's Okay. See, we need to stop striving for this and just receive it. Amen? Stay connected to the vine. Hebrews 5, 9 says, I'm going to end with this, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey, who be, who obey him. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing. Now, this is Paul speaking to the Philippian church. He says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Amen? I'm confident in this very thing, that he who started a good work in Deb, 
he who started a good work in Jeff will be faithful to complete it. Because God finishes what he starts. God follows through with what he says he's going to do. Oh, my gosh, that happened again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pastor Dennis does that all the time. And I write, write it down to that. Well, that was really good. Yeah. But it's true. He does, right? He's the author of salvation. So you got saved. That wasn't the end all. You got saved. That was the beginning of a journey with Christ. A good journey with Christ that... of the church and lots of great things that God did through people. One was John Wesley. I mean, it's amazing what God did to this man because when he started out, he was a religious jerk. And there were um, spiritual mentors in his life that told him that because he didn't know about grace. You know, he just, he just knew about reading the Bible, but he didn't read the New Testament enough to see about the grace that God had for him. And he didn't know if he was saved or not. And so one day, he has this spiritual encounter, and there's this knowing that happens. He receives Christ into his life, and then God starts doing a good work in him. And he starts changing in his life personally. But as long of him changing, there were a few good men around him that he inspired to be connected to God that changed them too. And it turned into this movement that literally hit the whole world. Absolutely amazing. The things that happened there. He got together with two guys. And they were open and honest with each other. And they read the Bible together and they prayed. And then it turned into a small group. And then before you know it, he was sending out a couple people from the small group to establish other small groups. And the church literally, that Wesleyan movement, exploded. That's a great work. God did that in him. God has other great works that he wants to do in you. And it might not be this huge revival thing, but it's a lot, it might be smaller. It might be a lot smaller, but that doesn't matter because success for us is doing what God says to do. That's what success is. So if you're called to be a Christian auto mechanic, get out there and be a Christian auto mechanic. We went to a water sar safari, and um, one of my favorite places to, eat, to go and get something to eat is Dippin' Dots. Dippin' Dots, cookies and cream. Love it. And there's this young lady there. She's maybe... 16. She's a little nervous and she's getting our dipping dots together. And I look at her, her arms and they're covered in Jesus wristbands. One of them says, be the light. Another one says, God loves me. And she's, she's got them all over her. And uh, I told her, I said, boy, I love your wristbands. And she goes, oh, she goes, I'm blessed. Well, you know what that means. That's Christianese for I'm saved. She's being the light. She's 16 years old, and I believe that she's fulfilling what God told her to do by being in the little ice cream stand, giving me dipping Dots. Hallelujah for that. <laughs> See, what we do, this is in my notes, but let me just go way off a little bit. We qualify certain things to be amazing, God, huge things, and they are, but in God's eyes, the big things are no different than the little things that he calls us to do and be. I've had people in my life that may not have had these huge, massive churches, maybe small churches or no, or no churches at all, but they've spoken into my life. They've made huge impact in me. See, that's what being a successful Christian is. It's taking the little things that God says to do and doing them. It's having that conversation with somebody at the grocery store about something great God is doing in your life. Successful. It's showing up to work every single day, on time, going above and beyond what you're asked to do, being a light in the darkness. That's success. That's doing what God said to do. Amen? And so that's what Paul is saying. And as Christians, that's what we're called to do. He who started <coughs> a good work in you. Do you remember? I remember. I wrote a song called I Remember one time. I remember. When I gave my life to Christ, I was 10. I remember. I remember what happened. 
I remember the change. I remember all of a sudden being introduced to, I want to say person, but he's not a person, he's God, and being able to talk to him about stuff and being able to, to just open up my heart when I was feeling heavy. It was so simple. My mom came to the kitchen table. And she had gone to a Methodist Bible study in the She gave her life to Christ in that small group. And she comes in the kitchen, and me and my sister, they're ready for dinner, and she starts talking about what happened. I was 10. Lori was 7 or 8. We gave our lives to Christ right there at the table. And I remember going to bed at night, looking up at the ceiling. Something's different. All of a sudden, I started having conversations with God. Just little things. And it just things started happening. It was so cool. I remember my family was not, I wouldn't call them poor or struggling really financially, but we were part of the lower middle class that didn't, that made too much to get help, but didn't make enough. To get, you know what I'm saying? And so me and my sister knew that. And as we grew up, I mean, I, re I remember um, we always had food on the table. Uh, we were blessed with things. You know, we had a camper. We could go do things together. But there were times in our life when we knew that they're putting the brakes on the spending because we don't have any money right now. We've got us, you know. And um, I never forget, I, was, I got the opportunity to go to uh, basketball camps with my dad. Now, these basketball camps cost hundreds of dollars. I could have never gone if it wasn't for my dad being a coach, you know. One year, I went to seven basketball camps in, in one summer. I loved basketball. just ate it up. But what would happen is, is when you're playing basketball, the courts are hot. Um, the pavement's probably 110, 115 degrees on the pavement. Not up here, but on the pavement. And so you're playing a lot of ball. Um, the sole in your shoe gets wore out pretty quick. And I had what they call Chuck E. T's. You guys probably don't even know that Chuck E. T's. Some of you guys know, but a lot of kids walk around with Chuck E. T's. I'm like, hey, I like your Chuck E. T's. They're like, what's that? Okay. Chuck E. T's. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Chuck Taylor's Converse, right? If I said that to the adult, the older ones, they under ones, they understand that. And um, I, uh, what I would do was I would secretly wrap duct tape around my Chuck E. T. sneakers, and people thought that I was just trying to do something different. But what they didn't realize is that the courts were so hot that it burned a hole in my sole, and then it started burning a hole in my socks. And I didn't want to keep telling my parents that I needed new socks. I'm getting holes in my socks, so I thought, hey, I could wrap them with duct tape, you know. So I'm wrapping them with duct tape, and one day I'm walking up, it's Golden Valley Basketball Camp, and uh, walking up, um, and I went down to the store in the basement, this big, huge basement, they had ping pong tables there, and food and snacks, but they also had a store where they sold sweatshirts, t-shirts, and sneakers. And um, they had just come out with leather sneakers, and they would label them. So there was like a Larry Bird sneaker, and it was green. There was a Magic Johnson uh, sneaker that was purple and yellow, and there was even this brand new sneaker that came out called Air Jordans that were red and black with white in the middle. And back then, these sneakers were expensive. Chucky e. Taylor's cost about 32 bucks, I remember. That's how much they cost. And um, they were in the store, but then there were these other sneakers that cost $100. You see, for me, $100 was how much we got for our school clothing every year, the whole thing. Ames Department Store, you got 100 bucks. That's all you got. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm thinking in my head, I'm looking at the store, and I'm thinking, God, I just I really like some new sneakers, you know? And I remember thinking, I'm doing my best, but th I just, you know, I'd love some new sneakers, you know? And I just left and went away. And maybe a day later, I was walking up in the middle of Golden Valley, and this guy comes up, and he was familiar to me. I, I, I kind of knew a, a little bit about who he was, um, and, um, but I didn't know who he, who he was. But anyway... Um, my dad was friends with him, and so we, uh, we went down to the camp store, and uh, he puts his arm around me, and he, he says, he goes, I want you to look here, and he goes, you can pick any shoe in the store, and I'm going to buy it for you. And so I picked the Chuck, Chuck Taylors, because, you know, we were polite back then. <laughs> He's going to give this to me. I was, he, go, he goes, I, I guess you don't, he is like, I can't remember the exact words, but I, I don't think you understand it, kind of get it. He goes, um. I'm going to make you pick the most expensive shoe in the store. And uh, I picked out Air Jordans, and I got to wear those. I found out later, I knew that he was a friend of my dad's, but I didn't realize that he was the owner of the camp, that he had gotten rich through oil, and he was uh, uh, Jerry Morabito. 
should sound a little, little familiar to you. And, um, man, that's amazing. And when I got the shoe, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, I deserve that. Woohoo! Yeah. No, I was like, <laughs> I'm like, thank you. But then I was like, thank you. And my dad was like, what the heck happened? Where did those come from? You see, God loves you. He wants to take care of you. For Jerry, I believe that they, God was using him to bless me. That was a little thing that was a big deal. So let God use you, church. Amen? In the little things. Oh, in the big things if he gives you opportunities. But what is little and big in comparison to God? Just do what he says. And let God do great things through you. Amen? Let's stay rooted. Somebody say, let's stay rooted. Let's stay grounded. Somebody say, let's stay grounded. <laughs> right? Let's stay built up. Somebody say, let's stay built up. Right? And as you're connected to the vine, you're going to produce some fruit. Amen? And it's going to be good fruit. Not crappy fruit, but good fruit. Amen? And it's not about what you do. It's about that you're connected. Amen? So when the devil comes to you and says, well, you know what? You know, you haven't, you haven't been to church in three years. It's over for you. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Bob. <laughs> right? He's, what's that? Amen? You, you know, you, uh, you haven't prayed all week. Game over for you. You haven't done this, and you haven't done this, and you haven't done this. He comes up with the whole, you haven't done da 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 And because of this, you are a good for nothing, and nothing's ever good going to happen for you. And you're going to just end up being like your unsaved family was, like your granddad was, like your great-granddad was, stuck in a rut. That's not Jesus. That's the devil, right? So what does Jesus do? Jesus says, I love you. I forgive you. Get connected again. Amen? And, and, and he builds us and he grows us, and it's a great thing. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you're an awesome God, and uh, I thank you for your connect, the connection we can have with you. Help us to remember, Lord. Lord, I pray that you help us, Lord, not to uh, beat ourselves up when we don't do what we think we should do, that we should just love you and receive that love that you give us, Lord. Help us to stay grounded. Help us to stay rooted. Help us to stay built up in you. We love you, Father. Amen. All right, it's time for our Connect video.